Okay. Again, you've all probably heard this spiel before, but we are doing this as a series of roughly one to one and a half hour webinars spanning over five weeks. Uh, please be aware that each of these is going to be recorded and made available for future viewing via YouTube. And as usual, uh, please keep to uh, what's become the normal Zoom protocol of keeping your, your mic muted. While other people are talking, raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question and somebody from the office will call on you. And today we're gonna to focus on cyber infrastructure, communications and tech pool updates. And with that, I'll hand it over to Doug, thank you. Thanks, Craig. Uh, good day, everybody. Good to see everybody back. And those of you joining us for the first time um, for our fifth session of the annual meeting via webinars. Um, our first presentation today is going to be by Jim Hollick, providing an overview of cyber infrastructure and cybersecurity, kind of laying the, laying the groundwork for what will follow uh, the next few presentations afterwards. And Jim, thanks for doing this. With that, sure. please take it away. Briefly. Uh, if you all are anything like I was a couple of years ago, uh, given a choice between a spending an hour talking about cyber infrastructure and cyber security or B, it would be B, almost in any case. Uh, this is one of these issues that we haven't all, it hasn't been the most exciting thing that we've, you know, the topic that we talk about, but it's with the increased complexities on our ships, uh, particularly the new ships, and uh, the expansion of our networks and uh, expansion of internet and the growth of the importance of our science networks as well as, as the external access to our ships uh, in the actual physical plant, the ship systems uh, by people from the beach, it has become a huge issue. And not only is it important to be safe with this infrastructure, uh, it's also the law. So it's something we have to pay attention, pay attention to. I mean, ever since they sank the, the mail buoy, uh, this has become a more and a bigger and a bigger issue that we've had to deal with. Uh, so let's start very, very brief uh, introduction. First, first slide, just so that we, go ahead, Alice. Click the button. Thank you. What is cyber infrastructure? I mean, there's lots of words on this page, y'all. Don't think like you have to read this. Close your eyes. I'll read it to you like your mama used to. But uh, listen more than than uh, needing to read. It's what is it? What does it include? It includes tons of stuff. All the physical and digital assets used in providing information technology for the communication, storage, and processing of digital information. Now, the physical assets include the computers, servers, networking equipment, data centers, and even commodity things like keyboards, flash drives, et cetera. Now, the digital assets we're talking about are less tangible and would uh, include things like software, data sets, databases, radio spectrum, uh, power, HVAC, bandwidth, where we'll be talking about that later today, and connectivity. And thank you for John Haverleck for providing me this little summary. Uh, a cyber infrastructure plan and what ultimately we're going to really focus on uh, having in the future uh, is basically a cradle to grave life, life cycle and maintenance uh, program that keeps aging physical and digital assets up to date and at an adequate capacity for the mission that we have. Uh, it's necessary to be pro proactive about this instead of just waiting for problems to happen. Okay, next, please. Now, another term we use a lot is cybersecurity. Uh, cybersecurity is obviously part of cyber infrastructure, and it's also a very broad term. So it's, it's basically, it's fundamentally, it's based on three fundamental co concepts known as the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. It includes the body of technologies, processes, and practices designed to protect the networks, devices, programs, and data from attack, damage, or unauthorized access. And like I said, it's part of the broader cyber infrastructure plan. It's kind of common sense, but it addresses who has level of access to what assets. 
Uh, this is called authentication. Like for most people, we know what that is. It's a password, right? Something that that person knows. We can have multi-factor authentication, which is another layer. And it's something you know, coupled with something you have, like a key or a card or a fob or any number of different things. Again, we know all this stuff. Once you're sufficiently authenticated, then you're authorized to, to, to do certain things. You can be authorized at different levels from read only to read, write, edit, delete, uh, and a variety of other things as determined by those in charge. Okay, next. Okay, what's the law? I said this is something we're gonna have to abide by, at least coming up with a plan. Uh, each operator is going to need to develop and integrate a cybersecurity risk management plan into their safety management system by the time of their first external ABS DLC survey in 2021. Furthermore, as members of uh, the large facilities at NSF and the vessels certainly are, uh, it requires the establishment of a robust cybersecurity plan. Okay, who's responsible for this? Um, well, I can tell you what, if there's an inspection and a certain vessel doesn't pass the inspection, I don't figure they're gonna to go to the techs. I figure that the inspectors uh, will probably go to the Shabbat or operator, the superintendent. But at the same time, the techs are usually people doing a lot of this work because they're techs. And traditionally they have worked on the computers and are more familiar with what's going on with the whole cybersecurity process. So it's an issue that we've been talking about quite a bit and responsibility is key. The governance uh, structure is going to be important to define. One thing we do know, however, is that there will have to be a single point of contact at each institution. Okay, next. Okay, so what are we doing? We had the trusted CI engagement, which we've talked about at the last meeting, and you can review Lee's uh, recommendations for the fleet, the recommendations from trusted CI uh, that he presented the last time we had this meeting. Uh, we've also initiated a pilot program to bring the ships into IMO compliance during 2021, and the next talk will focus on that. And we have established a cybersecurity working group. Uh, it's composed of techs, and uh, I think there's a port captain, there's some superintendents on there. And the, the object of this working group is to discuss these issues and to advise NSF on the path forward. And there have been some lively discussions about it. So the last one, the last slide I have is the most important one. What are we, where are we going and what are we thinking about now? Well, the cybersecurity working group is writing, currently is writing terms of reference for acceptance as an official UNOS committee. Uh, this is gonna be presented at the next council meeting for discussion and approval. And I don't know if it's been announced yet, but I understand it's gonna be in Hawaii at that, at that new island called Zoom, but we will discuss it at that point, whether they can be a new committee or not. And I, I don't see there's any reason why not. So these next four questions are what we've really been discussing. Should cybersecurity plan be integrated into the RVSS, the Research Vessel Safety Standards? Um, one reason why we think it, it should is because by the cooperative agreements that Rose manages, uh, operators are required to adhere to the Research Vessels RVSS. So, a second thing we're discussing is uh, Trusted CI made this recommendation and we've been talking about, does the fleet need to have a chief information security officer or CISO and or a chief information technology officer, a CITO? Uh, and if so, who do they work for? And what is the governance? What is the, 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 the structure under which they would work? Good questions, right? Uh, and the last two kind of go together, and we've been talking about whether our current solicitation, which is 19602, which, by the way, it took about six months to write and another at least twice that long to be approved, is it adequate? Uh, or, or do we need to rewrite it or at least edit it to define which program, with, you know, ship ops or tech services or, or whatever has the responsibility for this issue? Because right now it's not written anywhere. And it's confusing to people who like to have directions and I don't blame them. 
Is the time right to create another program within SFIPS to deal specifically with the fleet's you know, cyber infrastructure? In other words, instead of being split between instrumentation and tech services and a ship operations, perhaps a separate group uh, that handles all the computers, uh, all the upgrades, the networking, uh, the CISO and CITO and internet, uh, all the issues that we're going to be talking about today, except for the tech pool, um, it, it doesn't make sense to put that into a different program. There'll be no more money. You just take existing money and split it up a little bit differently. But uh, it does have the advantage that, that cyber infrastructure won't have to compete, at least in the same panel, with, uh, infrastructure, with things like instrumentation and tech services. OK, that's 10 minutes. Done. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. I think that's a great overview. I, uh, we, I think we have time for one question. I see that John Meyer has his, question, his hand raised. So, John? Just a quick point of clarity. Uh, university campuses typically have a defined cyber infrastructure plan. Jim, you said cybersecurity plan. Just making uh, the distinction there. Uh, cyber infrastructure plan that includes, that includes the cybersecurity aspect. OK. Great, thanks for that clarification. Jim, thanks very much for doing that. I think that was very helpful to lay the, the overarching framework for the, what we're gonna talk about today. And thanks for your great leadership and support through all this. Uh, first up now is cybersecurity pilot program, uh, Pam Clarks and who he's gonna provide that. Great, thank you, Alice, for loading the presentation. Yeah, this is uh, Pam Clark from Hui. Jim reached out to me uh, sometime uh, early uh, summer to uh, take lead on this program. And so if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, the program is a, a directed to address the needs for the 18 vessels um, of the NSF academic fleet um, and the 14 operators to meet the IMO cybersecurity and the DFARS requirements. Now the DFARS uh, mo mainly uh, are addressed towards just the um, Navy vessels or the ONR uh, uh, owned vessels. Uh, next slide, please. So the scope of work for uh, this, this pilot program really is just to get the, the ball rolling um, to meet the first tier of cybersecurity compliance to meet the IMO re requirements. And what it is, is the effort to um, identify the vulnerability and the cyber threats for all the systems that comprise the information technology, the IT and the operational technology systems of each vessel. And the, the IT, I think everybody's familiar with, that's the networks uh, across the ships, including science. And then the operational technology is really the fundamentals of um, the IMO uh, concerns. And that's the, the shipboard technology that runs the plant, the bridge, et cetera. And so uh, folks have, uh, well, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So the, the pilot program is, as Jim mentioned in the previous presentation, is the effort to develop the cyber security risk management plan that gets incorporated into the safety management system. And uh, as, as Jim stated, that is, the goal is to um, have that incorporated prior to the external ABS document of compliance for each operator. Uh, next slide, please. And I wanted to show this table. Everybody knows the institutions and the vessels, uh, but this is the scope of the fleet that we're targeting. And we understand that some vessels will be retiring in the near future and new vessels will be coming in. So it, because the cybersecurity risk management plan really addresses how each institution or operator develops their safety management system for their given operations, it's really, geared towards the institution, not so much as the individual vessels. So I just wanted to clarify, and this is something that we've been working on um, uh, over the last uh, four or five months. Next slide, please. And so uh, folks, the operators, uh, 
specifically the marine superintendents. Um, I've reached out to all 14 of these operators in the last couple of weeks to develop the first cut at the priority list. Um, so one of the things we're going to have to work on once we get a vendor under contract is to set up who, you know, which ship gets the first run through. And so right now, this is the first cut. Once we have a vendor on board and we're working um, towards it, this may be refined based on each individual institutions because there is a window that the ABS survey date uh, is um, finalized and we have to work with each operator on that. But this gives us a first cut. Next slide, please. And so just to summarize, the, the pilot program um, is managed, uh, the NSF program manager is Jim. Uh, I'm heading up just coordinating the overall project management. And Ken Feldman is really our key ITOT technical lead to talk about how um, each ship operator generally functions and, and controls their, their systems on board the ships. And then Scott Ferguson is taking on the overall contract manager position and he's actually handing, handling the RFP process that's currently out. So we really can't speak about that, but I just wanted to get let folks know that there is an open RFP right now um, through October 26th. And then once those uh, proposals come in, we'll review those and hopefully have somebody on contract to help with the whole fleet program uh, no later than the end of November, 2020. And next slide. And that's it. And any questions? Well, thanks, Pam. Um, look and see. I don't see any questions so far. So obviously you were just you dazzled everybody through brilliance. <laughs> but thanks for your your. No, you no, no, question. Go David. ahead. Hey, uh, Pam, what is, uh, you, you made a, the uh, reference between the IMO and the DFARS with the, um, with the Navy ships. What, is there a big, is there a significant uh, difference between those regulations? Uh, the Navy has more, uh, more requirements, um, but they follow a national standard. Uh, it's called NIST. I can't remember what the actual action, ac acronym stands for. It does take uh, some more effort to meet it, um, but it is, it will enhance the Navy vessels and it will enhance all the, the programs across the board. Okay. Is there any uh, strength in doing that for the uh, NSF ships as well, or is the IMO sufficient? I think we wanna see what the, you know, over the next 12 months, we'll really get a handle on what the increase is. It may be too excessive. Yeah, okay. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind and we can track it. and. If Navy, if Navy programs are using the other NSF ships, we may just have to, you know, go down that path, but that's uh, after the first year. Sure. Okay, thanks. Sure. Well, Pam, I mean, it's pretty impressive how fast you, Ken, and Scott have made, made this happen, and along with Jim's obviously support, you made this happen. So hats off to you. This is, you guys are not wasting time at all. So thank you for your efforts. Okay, I don't see any other questions at this time, so I think we'll, we'll keep on moving. Thanks, Pam, for being concise. Um, and we're moving on to the High Seas Net and Secondary Satellite Network update from John Meyer from Scripps. Uh, they've got a lot to report. They've been busy this year, so thanks. Take it away, John. Sure. Just give me a... Sorry, I get my headset going here. Hopefully that's better audio. Uh, so hi, welcome. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, looks like my audio just shifted. Is that okay? Is that thumbs up? Uh, so we'll go over six different topics. I'll try and keep it lean here. Some of this is a little bit of a repeat of what you heard before with an update on some recent activity and some 2021 plans that we're currently working on right now. So we'll go to the next slide. The key takeaway for High Seas Net as a project is that it's been a major year of change for us. So we took over management of the secondary satellite network as of January and basically had an ambitious plan to hit the ground running. 
which was immediately interrupted by the pandemic. And we had to figure out a lot of ways to work around that. Uh, that's generally characterized now, although we still continue to suffer from logistical impacts of just shipping things and getting people to ships uh, in this era. Uh, but so far, so good and generally met with success. Uh, by consolidating the effort of both satellite systems programs into under one roof, so to speak, we've uh, rapidly realized in our budgeting process how to have some financial efficiencies, and that's basically driven rapid adoption of commercial services based on available budget that we currently have. So, uh, if, of course, if we wanted to go all high performance all the time, the, the notion of revisiting custom ground station and some of the other things that we've done uh, traditionally in high seas net would be on the table, but right now to get better bang for our buck within the kind of spectrum of budget we can reasonably expect, the commercial services uh, are offering a lot that a, a custom boutique solution cannot. Uh, also, key thing here is satellite communications as a market is changing a lot because low Earth orbit is coming to market, although uh, not in a super complete fashion at this time, but that's going to evolve over the next several years, uh, you know, few years, and we're going to watch that happen. And uh, as I'm sure we're all aware, the demand for high performance networking while in the field is very strong for uh, from where we sit. And so uh, low Earth orbit is really going to be able to offer that in a meaningful way. that's much better than a geostationary satellite like we've been using for the past decade plus. And so everybody's eagerly waiting that we're trying to set the stage as much as possible to continue the work that we're doing now with the resources that are available now while future proofing as much as possible. Uh, another big hot topic we've had this year is COVID-19 risk mitigation. Um, people wanting to do conferences like this uh, while at sea and uh, essentially balancing their 21st century needs going out into the field while tending shop attending home fires back at home. That can be as simple as uh, signing off on timesheets, uh, doing basic administrative duties that are difficult to step away from in the 21st century. And so having that steady communication uh, was something that was already a priority for our project and something we were committed to proceeding slowly and steadily towards bettering. Uh, but the, the outbreak of the pandemic really uh, put the magnifying lens on it. Uh, and then, as I said, we're in the throes of 2021 planning and acquisition. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Next, please. Uh, so I don't want to read through all this, but the punchline here is we're, we really need full sky views. So to have that steadiness of networking so that we can have conferences like this and not have people dropping off, dropping, dropping on, that sort of thing. So if you want any sort of real time communication, simulated sky view, or top of the ship is really the way to go for any system that's capable of higher performance. And so that's sort of our mantra of what we've been espousing for a while. And it's something we're marching toward, but it's gonna take us probably a few budget cycles to really get there. So we're starting in on some overhauls of some ships in 2021, and we did what we could to sort of get the overall fleet to a baseline this year to address basic performance needs. And now we're trying to focus on getting that highly available performance, that 99% capability where, you know, it's just really not tolerable for the ship to be down for more than about 15 minutes <clears throat> uh, in terms of online capability. That's our goal. And that's that's based on real world figures of, uh, you know, ship bobbing around in the ocean and trying to target something in the sky. Uh, that's 99%, about 15 minutes a day in eruption or three days a year is an accomplishable uh, figure for a ship in the ocean. Uh, you want to talk different, Disciplines, you can get 99.99%, but uh, for a ship, 99% is reasonable. Uh, we've also been catching a lot of expansion requests based on COVID-19. And so uh, we've been consistent about saying that we uh, appreciate 90 days when possible. Anything you can do to work with your science parties to get it, it's going to guarantee better outcomes. Uh, but I will say we've managed to scramble the jets and get a few expansions done this year that we really weren't certain would happen. So that's great. Uh, it's great that uh, we're actually spinning one up today for Savannah. Um, it, it's great that we're able to support those things, uh, but do want to emphasize that planning ahead results in less expense and you know, less stress for everybody involved. And the more we can accomplish that, the more we can achieve financial efficiencies. So uh, 
uh, I'll get off my soapbox on that, uh, but uh, want to highlight the importance that uh, we look at actively look at the ship's calendars as our beginning baseline for what is the ship doing and uh, any effort that the, the ships can do to keep their calendars accurate and up to date as plans change, which I know this has been a banner year for plans changing, uh, super appreciated on our end. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'll just briefly touch on this. I did this at the last meeting we we're all here, but we did do a major overhaul of our up, uh, website. We continue to update it. And so uh, if you haven't been there lately, lots of information about the current plans, state of affairs, et cetera, there. So would encourage you to uh, read if uh, you are interested in coming up to speed. Next slide. Uh, so we've got two systems that we support on the ships. Every ship within ARF is or is planned to have Fleet Express. And then there's really a line in the sand once we get up to intermediate and above uh, where we probably have two systems due to the work profile of the ships. So we'll talk about that next. Uh, but specifically, Fleet Express is already a system of systems. It's really Global Express, KA band, uh, the one meter dome, if you've seen those, and then it's a little small fleet broadband domes that we've been using for a while. And the, the punchline here is when KA is up and available, that's what you use. It's generally much, much, much faster than the backup fleet broadband. And so you really never want to be using fleet broadband, but you don't have a total just offline, I can't do anything when one system goes down. The system is set up to fail over to the fleet broadband from uh, the KA when conditions warrant it. And so for a lot of smaller ships, uh, this is pretty adequate. And so we've been, we've been pretty happy with uh, the pre-installed systems and rolling out the new ones uh, within the fleet. Um, one meter domes for the KA, higher performance, 30 centimeter for the L band. Uh, I'm too steeped in this, but uh, basically KA band is higher frequency, which means you can get more throughput. L band's much lower frequency and about 20 times less. And so you're gonna be able to shoot through clouds and be able to talk in a storm and things like that. Performance capability of the KA band side of things is up to 10 megabits, but you have to have a, a more modern antenna to achieve that. If you have a older antenna, you're gonna be pinned at about five megabits ship to shore, uh, although you can get something more like 10 megabits short of ship. Uh, the global coverage map that's up here uh, has been emphasized to us strongly over at High Seas Net from Marlink that while this map shows where Fleet Express can work. It's there's not a guarantee that everywhere within this footprint will work. Uh, so specifically, we've seen problem areas um, occur without sufficient planning in this kind of light gray region, just to the west of South America. And so if, if you have a ship going somewhere west of South America, all the way toward the east side of South America, uh, it will probably take some negotiating it may or may not be successful uh, with Inmarsat to get coverage there. And so again, earlier communication, better for that situation. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, well, one final point here uh, before, could you go back one? Uh, uh, we did get a upgrade, uh, the last line item here. Uh, in doing our 2021 budgeting, Marlink was able to offer us a same price, upgraded components, GX 100 NX model of antenna. So we are now buying those from 2021 onward. And the takeaway there is those have LEO compatible capability. So as LEO options come out, we actually stand a chance, especially in a two radome situation of being able to track one satellite as it moves across the sky and track the other, which is what's needed for LEO. So every ship in the fleet uh, well, ultimately, as you know, as life cycle gets changed out, have an antenna that meets that criteria. But if we want to be able to leverage Leo, we will have to start exploring having two domes on a ship, uh, which may not be practicable for every ship. I understand, but just uh, just so everybody understands, uh, as we're buying new ones, uh, we we are having some degree of future proofing mixed in. Okay, now next slide. Um, so where we're at right now is we've got a new system, sorry, a dual set of systems on order for Atlantis, dual set of systems on order for Sekuliak. Uh, we've got a little image here of a recent failure on Walton Smith uh, of an aging fleet broadband ray dome. Uh, you don't want to see that kind of, kind of thing happen to your axis. And uh, we've just got a number of systems that these fleet broadbands are workhorses. They work great. 
and uh, this is about the third or fourth system we've gotten snake bit by where everything seems stable and there's suddenly a catastrophic failure in the past uh, nine or so months uh, that we've been managing this. So uh, just some gremlins out there lurking for us. And so uh, we're with 2021 funds, we've got a bulk purchase on order. There are small percentage of ships in the fleet that uh, don't need a life cycle replacement at this time, but we're uh, have about 16 systems on order that is we're being sent to individual ships. And it's just a drop-in replacement. A Marlink's position is generally that, uh, that you know, it's similar to what we had with Worldlink. These fleet broadband domes are really kind of, you just swap out the components. You don't bother fixing it unless you're desperate to get something working like uh, this. we were in this picture. Um, other activity we have planned a little bit later is Sally Ride's getting a mass modification and we'll be relocating uh, the GX100 HP system that was placed on the ship in February to the top of the mast, similar to Neil Armstrong, and, and get that 99% coverage out of that system. So we're looking forward to that. We've had uh, a real pickle of a time figuring out a functional way forward for Rachel Carson. Uh, we believe the stars are aligned for us to be able to identify a way forward, but it's it's going to require some heavy duty, uh, you know, looking at the engineering of how the central mast for the ship is constructed and how it could be modified. And so right now, uh, because of the nature of how the ship works, it's financially viable for us to just keep on with pay by the bite uh, fleet broadband for Rachel Carson until we get to the next shipyard at, at sort of the, the maximum length uh, or sooner as feasible. So uh, we're, we're proceeding with a slow burn on a solution for Rachel Carson. All the equipment is in place, but getting it on the ship has been a challenge. Um, the other thing that I'll talk about more in depth here is that ocean and global class vessels are expected to get leased hardware going forward, and that includes Fleet Express systems, um, although that's a little bit more complex than saying it that simply, but I'll leave it at that. Um, so expect to see lease systems come on board. Shouldn't impact you as uh, ship operators too much, but uh, a little bit of a change from how we've been doing things. And generally speaking, we do have a number of other activities planned for 2021, but we're still finalizing our budget plans for that. So it's a little bit too early to speak about uh, any of that in detail. Next slide, please. Ceiling Plus is basically the commercial version of High Seas Net. So that would be this large dome we got pictured uh, recently installed on Ravel. And the, the plus aspect of it is uh, Iridium Certus, which is really just for Marlink to remote in and diagnose problems so the techs on the ship don't have to. We've been able to use that on several occasions so far, and that definitely seems worth the offload of the tech and more straightforward for how Marlink provides service. They have more eyes in, able to identify problems quicker, all that. And the, the little Certus antenna that comes with part of that system is about the size of a large pizza in diameter, weighs about 30 pounds, has a pole mount kit, so very easy to place on a ship. So we're currently in the throes of getting any ship that doesn't have that uh, feature uh, purchased and, and delivered and figuring out a way to identify that. Another uh, big thing that we got to do, which is actually ongoing right now, is uh, we're doing an 80 megabit average uh, performance. And that was that's Marlink's claim of the fastest performance they've been able to achieve with a 2.4 meter dish like the one pictured here. And it's currently ongoing right now on Rebel. So we've got uh, two transponders uh, talking just to Rebel, which is uh, we've only ever done half a transponder before. So we're pretty excited to be working with Marlink on trying this out. And uh, maximum throughput short of ship is 100 megabits. Uh, committed is 60 megabit. And then ship to shore is 50 megabit committed, 60 megabit maximum. And we've... Uh, We'll talk about that in more detail later, but we're, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, just seeing this type of hardware being able to perform and you know, what is possible given uh, funds. Uh, <clears throat> the larger ray domes, the, the C-band KU capable domes like this, as well as uh, the stuff we have on the intermediate, which is KU only, is really only um, more practical to consider for any intermediate or bigger, which is why we only have these systems on these larger ships. In addition to that, those ships tend to work more time at sea. So having two systems is more critical for uh, maintaining stable communications. And uh, again, emphasizing the importance of understanding ship schedules. Uh, if you go to the next slide, actually, this will sort of highlight it. 
uh, we can save a notable amount of money if we put ships on this regional beam that's at the bottom center of this slide. And so if there's going to be a sustained period of time where your vessel is going to be in this footprint, uh, it can be very useful for us in terms of uh, the bill we send to NSF for uh, <clears throat> uh, by leveraging this. So the more we can have ships leverage regional beams, obviously we have to go where the research takes us and we can't always do that. Uh, but the more we can plan for that in our budget and uh, ideally we'll uh, get the budget down or at least level and be able to work with our funding agencies toward getting more bandwidth, uh, which I think everybody wants uh, as, as we wait for more high performance options to come. And it was the last line item on the previous slide. We don't have to go back to it, uh, but we, we still have two ships using traditional high seas net. That's the Kuliak and Sally Ryan will be converting to Sealink Plus at the early part of uh, 2021 for Skuliak and then sort of Q2, Q3 for Sally Ride in and around a shipyard period. Next slide, please. Uh, so I already touched on this, but we're getting the intermediate ships upgraded from C-Link to C-Link Plus. Uh, Thompson is uh, getting a conversion from High Seas Net to C-Link Plus. It's in shipyard right now and, and we'll be, uh, we're working November, December to get that conversion happening. While they're also Ravel style, Atlanta style, moving the 2.4 meter dish to the top of the ship and being able to achieve that physical full sky view, that 99% uptime. Uh, we're pretty excited to be working with Atlantis. They're getting, uh, they've already got a top of the ship installation, but their radome was aging. So we're getting them a new system exactly as pictured on Ravel here. And then uh, we're getting them dual Fleet Express domes, and uh, they're they're going to have dual full sky view coverage uh, on with high performance domes. Pretty excited about that. And then similarly, Sekuliak is in need of an upgrade, and uh, because of the nature of the high latitude work that Sekuliak often does, uh, it was a little bit early to market. But while we were buying, we asked the question of Marlink if we could get generation two system for Sekuliak so that they would have double the amount of Leo exploration options over the next five years while this hardware is on board. So I won't get into the nitty gritty of that, but the punchline is uh, because of the high latitude nature and it gives us experience proven out newer equipment, uh, all the stakeholders agreed that it was worth doing that for specifically for Sekuliak. So we'll be getting dual 2.4 meter domes for C-Link as well as dual uh, uh, Leo capable NX domes for the Fleet Express. So pretty excited about that as well. Uh, every ship in the fleet that has an iDirect modem for C-Link, which would be uh, the ships that we did earlier in this year, uh, is on the to-do list to get a conversion to a new tech modem. Uh, for the, the new tech modems offer a lot better uh, massaging of the signal going back and forth from the ship, and so it gives gives more potential. We had to pull heroic efforts to get that work on a Ravel. Uh, that is part of what is making this current super duper mega expansion on Ravel possible is that modem. Um, and uh, talked about it last meeting, but we still have plans to keep the high season at ground station active and available for expansion work for the foreseeable future. Next slide, please. Uh, so a little bit about the maximum test shot. It's, you know, I know it's not gonna be very legible, but uh, if you see this graph of throughput, this little histogram looking red item at the bottom right, that's basically Ravel's last 24 hours of activity as of this morning. And that large hump on the top graph is the shortest ship activity because while we had this big mega link going, we, at, we were trying to figure out if we get the aggregate utilization of the ship to stress out the link and sort of fill it up and in terms, in terms of network health, this is very healthy. Everything looks good. We were able to achieve maximum performance and reach up toward that 60 megabit or 100 megabit, a uh, little bit uh, shorter ship throughput by asking everybody to all try and stream at once, Zoom, YouTube, Netflix, all that. Just try and do everything all at once. Turn the firewall off, try it after dinner. We had a sustained period of hours and basically everything was fine. Everything worked. Uh, while conditions to use a satellite uplink are not uh, necessarily as great as your home modem, uh, in compared to what people's typical uh, experiences at sea, this is you know a lot more like a hotel than a, a research cruise. And so we're pleased to continue to collect metrics on this and sort of prove out that while uh, we're definitely waiting eagerly for the next Leo capable options, uh, it is possible to get pretty high performance 
with geostationary, and that was something Marlink was happy to help demonstrate as well. Um, so uh, takeaways, uh, Bruce uh, Applegate, who's on the ship right now, sent me an email this morning and he, he pointed out, hey, I'm able to use two-factor authentication with my phone like I do normally at home. I'm able to VPN into campus, that's no big deal. I'm able to access shared drives that are on campus, that's no big deal. I don't have any problem using my email Zoom calls and uh, you know, uh, something that I know the funding agencies don't like to see is able to stream the World Series and you know, all that's concurrent. <clears throat> Um, and so, you know, basically life is pretty normal with a link at this level. And what the stats are showing us that if we were a little bit conservative in our behavior, we could probably tolerate something more like a 20 megabit range kind of link and probably be able to achieve 80% of what I'm talking about here. And so that's why tests like this are, you know, are helpful in, in understanding that. So we're pretty excited about it. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about it more later, but uh, I think that's probably enough on it for now. Let's jump to the next slide. <clears throat> uh, leasing we want to talk a little bit about. So this is something we uh, piloted out at the beginning of this year. And the punchline is that's been a positive experience, especially for ships that have spent a lot of time at sea. And that's really where it starts to make financial logistical sense to have multiple systems on board because we really can't tolerate one system going down when it's the only system we have and we're out to sea 200 280 days a year kind of time, uh, then we, we really don't have a lot of time to affect repairs that require major overhaul. And uh, oh, I see Bruce is offering some sort of correction here. <laughs> uh, so having two systems is great and uh, leasing just gets us a lot of benefit. We get, it makes it uh, the vendor's problem, Marlink's problem to come affect repairs when and if equipment has issues and it also gives us a life, life cycle maintenance where because of the terms of the lease the the entity giving us the lease is really only willing to rent to us for five to seven years and so that enforces a life cycle change out so that we can make sure that we have systems on board that are stable and you know in, in line with some of the cyber infrastructure plan stuff jim's talking about have something that we we can count on to function which is basically the reinforcement we get on the support end of things is when when one of these systems doesn't work, it's a nightmare for the ship. And so we're, we're trying to figure out way, functional ways that work within budget to keep that from happening. Um, the, the other thing, I'm, I'm sure Jim might wanna pipe up and talk about this and uh, he's certainly been transparent about it. So I don't think it's uh, gonna, gonna be controversial or surprise to mention, but we do expect day rates to change as a result of this new hardware and the transitioning the Fleet Express, formerly Fleet Broadband set up from a funded just by the funding agency to uh, being incorporated in the ship's day rate. We do expect day rates to go up and currently in process now, but the expectation is we expect some sort of split between the ship operations program as well as the oceanographic technical services. And so the current thing that seems to make sense to most people involved seems to be that perhaps ships op ship operations would handle the leases and uh, OTS would handle the airtime. And so that's, uh, Pretty shortly gonna need to be discussed and, and finalized, but uh, not quite ready for final announcement at this time. So this is where we think things are headed to the best of our knowledge and that could change before we get done. Next slide, please. So that's really it. Uh, if there's any questions uh, or in lieu of time, uh, happy to end it here. Jim wants Quickly, to Quickly, I have a quick question, John. Uh, get it. So Scripps either has some very good sets and backdrops or Bruce and Lee are really out there right now. They're really out I, there, yeah. I see him running around. Bruce, Bruce isn't dressed for the office, so I'm sure he's out there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we've, we've been actually, this link got stood up on Monday. We've been having regular Zoom, phone call, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, this is, uh, from work I've done in other jobs, this is an adequate amount of bandwidth for a remote location for the personnel count to function on. You can't have some kind of bottleneck slowdowns, but uh, you know, if nothing else, the takeaway I want people to see here is, you know, this, uh, don't, don't hold me to this, but the rough math here, I, I did some back of the napkin math on this this morning, uh, the rough cost for a link like this, if we were running it daily, would be about $6,000 a day. Uh, if we just kind of project what's normal money per month per megabit kind of for a SAT provider. Um, we're getting a deep discount because Marlink wanted to help us, you know, demonstrate their capability 
they were trying to give it to us for free and then the logistics were just too much because uh someone had to run around a ground station and you know make sh kick people off uh, their link and so they could free up all the spectrum for us to do this test but uh and uh, this test is leveraging a regional link which you know deep ocean would be a different story for being able to pull this off as quickly as possible but uh yeah uh if uh not trying to throw anybody under the bus uh it's it's got to be a priority for all stakeholders involved but I want people to understand that it's not the technology, the current technology that's holding us back in terms of being able to achieve functional performance on ship. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Or actually just a comment. Okay. So Ravel, Ravel is out there on their sea trials and they've been, I'm obviously, all I care about is the ADCP, but it's out there doing its, um, they're, they're turning it on as they can and they haven't gotten to the period when they're gonna dedicate time to the ADCP, but they said they would. Uh, but in order to try to understand the calibrations and stuff, we had a bunch of stops and starts and goofs and whatnot. And uh, I was able to go out and bring back um, half a gigabyte, uh, just like I mean, I'm at, just like I'm at home. It took as long for it to get from the ship to our server on land as it did from it to get from our server to my house. And uh, I would never try that otherwise. I always try to keep my data transfers down to the tens of megabytes, not a half a gigabyte. Um, when does the link go down? Uh, when, it's when, when, the, when the ship, when the ship, I lose that? <laughs> when the ship pulls in. So you'll, you'll have it for another week or two. Oh, okay. yeah, the, the key right. takeaway is, is when, you know, 21st century level of performance happens, productivity goes up for everybody involved. Well, it's, it's absolutely, uh, a game changer to be able to pull back the raw data like that during a cruise. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's really helpful in, you know, in my mind, at least demonstrating, why infrastructure like this is important is uh, many, many hours are not spent dealing with a slow and non-performing link. Well, thanks, John. Very impressive. And now uh, Bruce is out of uh, out of office. That means nothing anymore now. I <laughs> know. <laughs> we will we will pepper him with questions and things. So no, appreciate all the the great work. Uh, despite the pandemic and the curveballs that threw you guys this year. You've accomplished a lot and thanks for the great work and uh, a lot of progress yeah and the the progress on getting the installs done we had planned is also owed to the operators they really worked with us to make things happen nice um i any other one, one of the last questions for uh john before we move on to the next uh, presentation i think it was very good i'd like to interrupt real quick um i don't know if everybody's seeing the chat but um, Sharon Cooper pointed out that that kind of connection would be awesome for education and outreach as well. Um, just thought that should be mentioned in our stream. Thanks, Brandy. Yep, and no doubt this will help a lot towards that end. So it's, it's, it's great news all around. Uh, with that, we're gonna move on to the next uh, presentation with, which is a uh, SATNAG update by Eric Grubel from URI. Uh, in case you didn't know it, Eric, also supports the UNOL's office at UW now as he is the programmer, keeps the ship time request system running and up to speed. Plus he's the one who did the update on it, you noticed in the last year. So we are very thankful for Eric's many talents and things that he does to help the uh, whole UNOL's community. And with that, Eric, please take it away. All right, thank you. I'm gonna leave my camera off to save some jitter here. I'm hiding in a corner of my house from my kids. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm, I'm presenting on behalf of SATNAG, the Satellite Network Advisory Group. Uh, next slide. So, so we were formed in, uh, by Jim Hollick in circa 2015-2016 in order to explore ways to make ship-to-shore comms and the user experience of uh, you know, scientists and crews a little more uniform throughout the fleet. So the current members are Laura Stolp, Ken Feldman, John Haverlack, and myself, who is the new guy. Um, so brand new for 2020, we formally defined our role with a mission statement and a purpose. So uh, to, to steward the objective, effect, effective and efficient use of ship to shore network resources and to optimize the positive customer experience for the UNOL's fleet. And I believe this is our old presentation, but our purpose is uh, we work in good faith as advocates to benefit the 
uh, academic research fleet over our personal or home institution interests. And we advised Jim, uh, NSF and the ARF community about key aspects of satellite communication, technology, bandwidth management, and networking. Next slide. So year in uh, 2020 year in review, uh, there was some forward progress on the next generation firewall in that the CyberRome ING devices are being replaced by a Sophos XG. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Sophos acquired CyberRome in 2014 and then declared the CyberRome devices end of life. So they're moving to Sophos XG devices. A lot of you have probably already received these, even though you might not have put them in service yet. Uh, high seas net performed the bulk procurement of those and we're considering it a stopgap solution just due to end of life of the cyber own. So e even though these Sophos XGs are, they are next generation firewalls in, in air quotes there, uh, they're not the next generation firewall that we really wanted or was hoping for, but they are more or less a drop in replacement. Uh, according to Sophos, you could just upload your old cyber own config file and it would work. But as Laura found out, there's a there's a little more to it than that. So and we'll talk a little more when I get to the wiki. And uh, so and we also updated the internet use policy for ARF vessels, raising the daily use quota to 400 megabytes per person. And a lot of that is due to the hard work of high seas net, who are, our bandwidth has doubled, at least on the intermediate class ships, I think it's doubled on the on the larger ocean ships also. Uh, we, we work pretty hard to keep the SATNAG wiki updated with uh, current info, tips and tricks. Uh, lately, we've been adding a lot of uh, uh, info on how to encourage remote participation from scientists ashore. And uh, Laura has also put on there a, uh, a guide on how to migrate from your CyberOme to your Sophos XG. And we also uh, attend a lot of UNALS community meetings up and uh, we represent UNALS and the ARF at uh, key meetings. Uh, big ones for 2020 were the, the UNALS CICS community that Pam presented, uh, the UNALS council meeting. Uh, we meet quarterly with high season net since our, uh, our fates are sort of intertwined and then uh, there was a two-part webinar series back in June for COVID-19 response. So part one was for ship operators and part two was a telepresence uh, presentation more for more geared towards PIs, how they could use telepresence and uh, bandwidth to encourage remote participation. Next slide. So out of that telepresence presentation came this table intended uh, for, for PIs and ship operators, uh, defining just sort of the different levels of telepresence, depending on what you're looking to do, whether it's simple VoIP, VoIP calls or Zoom sessions all the way up to level three, which could be like filming a high definition National Geographic documentary or something. So uh, what's important about level zero is, is that's, uh, just the minimum expectation that any scientist can expect when working on a UNOL ship now uh, without, without any further uh, configuration or anything. So you, you could walk right on board and be able to do audio only Zoom sessions and be able to do some, some decent file transfers ashore and uh, low bit rate streaming, things like that. Uh, level one there is, uh, using the existing bandwidth that we already have through high seas net with the fleet express and, and, uh, and the uh, sea link. And, but uh, it, it might need a little more configuration on behalf of the ship technicians to get some of that to work. And uh, that's, that's where you can start doing your zoom sessions and your larger file transfers and things. Uh, and then level two and three is where you, you would have to start uh, you would have to request a bandwidth expansion or even go with a third party uh, satellite bandwidth provider to do uh, a little more intense uh, real-time shore participation presentations and uh, filming documentaries and things like that. Next slide. 
So we also uh, attend uh, seminars and engagements that are external to uh, UNALS. Uh, some big ones this year are the, uh, the IMO 2021 Cyber Risk Management Guidelines hosted by ABS. Uh, uh, understanding cybersecurity through the lens of Coast Guard NVIC 0120, which is sort of cybersecurity for shore facilities, more intended for, for uh, shippers and commercial fleets more than, but it, but it's, it was still helpful. Uh, a lot of us attended the Trusted CI ARF Identity Management Engagement, uh, the 2020 CI CS Workshop, and the 2020 Cybersecurity Summit. Looks like, uh, all right, there we go. I got your back, Eric, apologies. All right, thanks, Alice. <laughs> okay, next slide. Uh, we've also been working to keep our uh, SATNAG wiki up to date uh, with uh, the latest information, try to uh, get rid of all the stale stuff as it goes out. Uh, some, uh, some of the newer stuff are SOFOS upgrades, telepresence and ship to shore solutions, uh, bandwidth management, tips and tricks, uh, maintain maintenance for some of the devices, uh, your modems, your antennas, things like that, and uh, links to resources that we find helpful or that you may find helpful. Next slide. All right, next, uh, this is our goals for 2122. Uh, first and foremost is uh, deploy the Sophos XG firewalls, get those up and running throughout the fleet, and then rebuild the traffic usage metrics, which we had with the Cyberome. But it was a, it was a little bit fragile, so we're going to try to get that up and running. And it's it's really useful to have those usage metrics to find out where all the bandwidth is going, in order to make better decisions about how to manage it, and uh, how to how to justify getting more bandwidth for for projects. Uh, there's a note there that if any of you operators uh, need a uh, need a Sophos XG, if you have a cyber room and haven't received a Sophos XG or, or you wanna get on board right now, you're not using anything, uh, please contact us and we'll figure something out. Um, next is we're working with High Seas Net and uh, the academic research fleet to develop a reference network architecture. This is, sort of, this is a new goal for 2021. And uh, it says there to standardize the physical and logical topology, but that's standardized isn't really the right word. It's more to like to come up with a set of best practices for designing your networks for, for security and uh, for, uh, for the operator and the customer to both have a more uniform experience. And uh, we understand that one, it's not a one size fits, fits all kind of a thing to with a reference network architecture. So, uh, you know, the needs of the small coastal ships versus the needs of the Sally ride or somebody like that. Um, and then uh, we will continue working on the next generation firewall by uh, defining a deployment strategy, uh, exploring practices for to maintain and, and secure them uh, with the CICS program, uh, and then uh, exploring captive portal versus QoS-based bandwidth control, because captive portals are um, sort of an antique now, and, and uh, a lot of uh, companies that build these next generation firewalls are moving away from captive portal models. So we, we need to do some experimentation and see if a QoS based bandwidth control will work. Uh, Cause you know, we have some unique constraints with bandwidth that most other industries don't have. And uh, we'd also like to have API based fleet wide metrics instead of uh, the way it is with the uh, cyber Rome and the, and the Sophos, which is email based. And uh, last, uh, maintain uh, our user-facing SACNAG wiki with uh, more tips, tricks, and best practices. Next slide. Okay, any questions? Hopefully the rest of the group can help me out here. Thanks, Eric. Uh, I'm looking to see if I see anybody raise their hand for any questions. Uh, great job, great job by the team. And help. I know you, the work you guys have done with firewalls the last few years is pretty amazing. They help and kind of standardize practices for managing bandwidth. It's been great. So, congratulations on the successes you got everybody's seeing. 
Uh, oh, I see John, John Meyer. Meyer. Yeah, just just quick comment. Uh, we did double the bandwidth for most ships this year, as much as feasible. Um, uh, something I didn't really highlight, but uh, we continue to be interested in uh, within budget upping the link. Now, John, once we move to the C-Link Plus, what could we expect for bandwidth? Right, right now, uh, I only know for the intermediate ship because that's what I work on. But right now, it's uh, 500 kilobit uh, on the FX and 500 kilobit on the on the KU band. So, uh, is that will we have the same amount of bandwidth, or will that increase as well? Uh, so, I'll put it this way: the the birthing count was a criteria in us deciding what tier of bandwidth we got for ships as, as part of this transition. So because more people on the ship equals more bandwidth need, right? And so the, mm -hmm. the intermediates are kind of in a weird spot. Uh, you know, they, they, they currently get the same as a regional uh, because there's not that granular of a choice. It's, you know, it's kind of 512 or one megabit and the dollars are pretty extreme. So, uh, so if we see a way forward within budget, uh, you know, double the regionals and intermediates or something like that, we certainly will pursue that. It's it's uh, the first year we had a lot of change planned with uh, figuring out how the day rate stuff is gonna work and all that. So uh, stay tuned is the best I can offer for now. But yeah, the, the intent is anytime, any opportunity comes up where we can fiscally responsibly upgrade bandwidth, we're, we're all about doing that. Okay. Thanks, Eric and John. Um, with that, we're going to shift gears and we're going to have uh, Piers Chapman is going to talk to us about the tech pool updates. So we've been talking about the technology. Now we get to talk to someone about the people to help make this work. So with that, Piers, the, the hey, deck thanks. is uh, Thanks all for staying on here. Uh, let's have the next slide, please. Okay, um, as you remember, um, NSF started the pool off about eight years ago with two techs. Um, then they issued this uh, five-year cooperative agreement, um, which we were lucky enough to win in 2016. So we're coming up to the end of it now. Um, but it's been pretty successful, I think. Um, current pool membership is 17, although we have actually had um, 25 people in the pool at various times. Uh, next, please. Um, as ever, we're still working very closely with uh, the UNOS technical support. So thanks, Brandy, for that. Um, and uh, she coordinates stuff with the ship operators. Uh, we haven't changed the way the pool works, so the techs are still considered as independent contractors. Uh, they have individual service agreements and separate supplements for each cruise, and they're all covered by group insurance schemes for um, maritime employers' liability and general liability, uh, but they are responsible for their own medical insurance. Next, please. And um, they're appointed, they get standard day rates, um, and they get covered for uh, travel, subsistence, and mobilization and demob days. And if they do more than 100 days a year, uh, this makes them eligible for training workshops or attendance at other meetings as well. Um, but as I've said several times before, the work isn't guaranteed. Um, and technicians can refuse to, be, to go on a cruise or opt out of the pool if they feel like it. Um, so that's perhaps the one weak link, really, um, at the moment. Uh, next, please. So um, looking at how the system has uh, moved, um, you can see here, I think, that we started off in 2016 with 17 um, contracts going out. This worked up to 50 um, last year. This year, of course, as we all know, things have been a total disaster. Um, so we back, we only issued 21 contracts, but even these didn't actually mean that we had 21 techs going to sea. Um, the numbers in red at the bottom are for the people who've left the pool, how many times they actually went out each year. Some of them took positions elsewhere. Some of them 
um, it was discovered that you know they and the pool didn't really fit, so we con uh, the contract wasn't renewed. Uh, we have had one technician join the pool this year, um, but because of COVID and everything else, um, hasn't been able to go out to sea yet, unfortunately. Okay, next please. So what's happened this year? Um, thanks to Brandy for this. Um, you can see here how, many, how the system has operated. Um, we have actually had eight cruises comprising 228 tech days completed. That's the pale blue in the upper right, uh, which is about 19% of the total estimate of 1,216 days that have been expected. Um, there are six cruises totaling 404 days, um, which are either scheduled or underway at the moment, so about a third. Um, but then the other 50%, pretty much, um, you know, has been cancelled. And this has either come about that the cruise was cancelled because of COVID, or the uh, PI withdrew the request for the cruise, um, or there was one other cruise where there was another um, problem, which is why the, uh, the tech didn't go on it. So, you know, we're a lot down on what we expected um, earlier. Okay, next please. So, what's been happening this year? Well, firstly, I want to apologize for uh, the fact that things have slowed down. Um, a and &M set the pool up to be flexible and to be able to issue new contracts quickly. But um, as you're all aware, if you're working from home, things don't always work as well as we would like them to. Um, and so things haven't been fast. And I really want to apologize to anybody who has been affected by this um, you know, for reasons pretty much beyond everybody else's control. Um, the other thing which the operators will certainly have noticed is that things have become more expensive. Um, and this is largely because of the fact that um, now the cruises are back up and running again, um, quarantine is necessary for anybody who goes on the cruise. Um, and if you have to travel to get on the ship, you only start the quarantine once you get there. Um, in some cases, you can go through quarantine on the, on the boat. In other times, you have to sit in a hotel. And so this can add costs of up to about 18,000 um, for a cost of a one pool technician going on a cruise, depending obviously on their salary level. Um, mm -hmm. Now, some operators have actually covered the costs of the hotel or subsistence. Others, um, the pool has paid for and uh, then the operators get billed for it. Um, the final thing is that the, co the cooperative agreement is due to end next February, uh, but both we and NSF want to extend it. And so we're working on getting an extension for at least another year. Um, and then maybe it can be extended further or maybe there'll be another RFP issued uh, for solicitation for a new cooperative agreement. Um, this still hasn't been decided yet, but uh, Jim and I both would like to see the uh, system operate in the future the way it's been operating um, up till now. Um, next, please. Okay, so despite all the uh, vicissitudes we've had this year, I mean, I think we can still say that the pool is a success. Um, but as I've said before, like everybody else, we have really been affected by COVID and we can only hope that um, next year will be better. Um, and in the meantime, thank you all for being patient um, where necessary and for continuing your support for us. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions people may have. Great, Thank, thanks, Piers. I'm looking to see if we can find anybody who's got some questions for you. Great job this year, being very adapting. Well, <laughs> and, we'll try. 
tough year for everybody, but especially managing a you know, flexible pool like this. Yeah. I would like to throw out as a comment, um, the COVID cruises that were canceled versus the COVID uh, requests that were canceled have to do with the number of people that were able to be aboard the vessel or the difficulty in a quarantine ahead of time. And also the number of requests does not necessarily equal the number of cruises. In some cases, techs would piggyback and do multiple cruises once they've gone through the quarantine process. Um, but those kind of statistics are hard to pull out. <laughs> yeah, or you'll have more than one tech on one cruise as well sometimes. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, I, I think uh, Moscow that... has their hand raised. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Um, so I have a question for both Pierce and Brandy. Uh, well, before that, thank you so much for running um, and operating the UNOS Tech Pool in this very, very difficult year. We obviously, you know, has been uh, uh, one beneficiary in the community from this um, particular program. I just wonder, so Pierce um, presented this as a um, group of uh, basically private contractors and then this, you know, stake pool as an umbrella um, kind of consortium organization to manage their time and the billing. How do you um, run the, for example, post-cruise feedback survey from between techs and then the uh, technician users facilities? Uh, we don't have anything to do with that. I imagine, Brandy, do you do that? Um, I have a uh, check-in with managers, typically post-cruise, uh, particularly for um, first time exchanges where a technician has sailed with an institution for the first time. Um, and I check in occasionally if they're repeat customers afterwards to see how things are going. Um, I don't have an official, here's a form, fill it out kind of survey. I find that I don't get um, candid or thorough responses in that case. Um, so I try and touch base individually. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or if you have a recommendation. Sure, sure. thank you. Yeah, but I mean, if, if you want to send um, comments in Massacre, please feel free to do that. We want to have <laughs> the operators and the techs uh, get the best bang for the buck. Thank you, thank you, Pierce. We'll do. Actually, while, uh, while I have the floor for that, um, I might say that we really behave kind of as a matchmaking service and an ability to get them paid. So um, the more feedback that managers have, uh, the more likely, and, and technicians as well who are in the pool, the more likely we are to set each of them up in, with a system for success for both, both of them. So uh, I encourage contacting me for any questions or comments or feedback at all from either party. Great, thanks, Brandy. Um, are there any other questions or comments about the, the tech pool or any of the other subjects we talked about today? I think we had some great presentations, a lot of good information, a lot of good success stories to tell, uh, despite the challenges of this year, especially. All right, I think it looks pretty quiet. So that wraps us up for today. We're off next week from these sessions because next week's RV Tech. So there's plenty more things going on uh, that Brandy, go ahead, Brandy, got a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to pipe up um, and let folks know that the way RV Tech is running this year, um, we're hoping that it means that individuals even at sea can participate. Um, we're using Slack for conversations over the course of the week. So if you can't view the presentations live, I would recommend still registering. The link is still live if you need it. Um, and uh, we're hoping that um, uh, the conversations are valuable to everybody can be accessed from C, even if you can't see the live presentation, which will be available on YouTube afterwards. So if you thought you were busy that week or um, uh, you uh, weren't gonna be able to visit during that time zone, um, for that time, I, I recommend still registering for the Slack conversations. 
Great. Thanks, Brandy. A lot of creative work, especially by Brandy, um, but also the rest of the office team for getting ready for our new tech next week, and as well as Lee and Jules have been kind of the brainchild behind all this. So thanks for all your efforts. We will return a week from Monday on, the, on uh, November 2nd when we have a few updates and we also have the keynote speech by Brandon Jones from NSF. So we can look forward to that coming up. Um, oh, oh, we're going to be nervous that day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Craig, any, do you have any final thoughts or comments? No, thank you everybody for a set of great presentations. It's a good day. Okay, well, I think we're done. We thank everybody for uh, dialing in today and we hope you have a great rest